name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so we have this beautiful, rather long passage from the Gospel of John telling us the story of Christ meeting Saint Fotini, the Samaritan woman at the well. So many things that we could think about and talk about from this passage. When you link it together with the words that we heard from Acts about spreading the gospel, we think about that image of Christ saying, lift up your eyes and see the fields are already white for harvest. We could think about and talk about spreading the gospel, the importance of reaching out to those who are around us. The idea that Christ knows everything that the Samaritan woman has done in her life, that he knows what's in our hearts and he loves us, what's in our minds. But what I wanted to focus on for a couple minutes for today is that one phrase that I think is so powerful and important for us, that one phrase where he says that we must worship in spirit and in truth. You don't hear too much in the New Testament, or at least in the Gospels, about worship. There's not a lot said about worship. And yet for us as Orthodox Christians, it's so central to what we do. When you ask people what their experience, what their basic experience of church is, they'll say Sunday morning, right? They come to the services. And so our most fundamental experience of church is worship. And so it's important for us to recognize what that little sentence, that little verse means when Christ says that God is spirit, the Father is spirit, and he wants those who worship him to worship in spirit and in truth. How important that is, and what does that mean? Because we come to church for our fundamental experience of God and encountering God, and it's a struggle, right? You sit there, or you stand there, and you're struggling for about an hour, if you came on time, maybe a little bit less, to focus, right? To pay attention to what's being said, to what's being chanted, to what's being prayed. And we're good for two, three minutes at a time. And then our mind starts to, what am I doing later tonight? What do I have to do this week? What did I do? What do I have to think about? What's going on with work? Oh, it's Mother's Day. Where are we? What are we eating tonight? And then, oh, wait, there's an entrance. Okay, what, what, the gospel's coming, communion's coming, and we're focused again. We're thinking again, we're praying again, and all of a sudden our mind starts drifting a little bit. And it's an ongoing battle or at least I hope that it is, where we're fighting to keep focus, to make sure that we're worshiping and that we're not just sort of standing there trying to let the services wash over us and absorb our encounter with Christ through osmosis somehow, that we're participating. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be, first and foremost, praying the services together. When we come to church, we're never passive spectators. Church is not a spectator sport. It's work. The very word liturgy means work of the people. And so we remember that in the early manuscripts, when we read about the services of the church, it says, priest, people, right? Yerefs, laos. There's never a point where it says, priest, choir, priest, chanters. It says, priest, people, priest, people. The idea is that there's a dialogue happening, a back and a forth, and that we're all participating as best as we can. We're worshiping. We're really worshiping in spirit and in truth. And that begs a few questions. Why do we come to church? Some people come to church because they're used to coming to church. They've come their whole life. That's what you do. Sunday mornings, you get up, you go to church. We want to have fellowship. We want to see our friends. We want to have parea. We want to be part of a community. But really, that's not about worship. We come to church to worship. We come to church to make a sacrifice and an offering to our Lord and Savior. We're not bringing animals anymore to be slaughtered and sacrificed like the Old Covenant. We're in the New Covenant. He has already made the sacrifice for us. He's made the offering. Now all we have to do is enter into that offering and worship, pray the prayers, sing the hymns. There are points where we're supposed to be singing and participating and praying, but at least trying to struggle every little bit 
to be able to sing every Kyrie eleison, to be able to pray every prayer together. The idea is that we're all praying together. I'm not doing it on your behalf. I'm leading you in doing it. The choir is not doing it instead of you. They're leading you in doing it. And the idea is that those prayers all together have power. They resonate because there's one voice, one voice that resonates. And so it rises to God because it's louder and more powerful. It's like burning incense in a little censer and one little plume of smoke going up versus a whole volcano and all of that smoke going up. You can see a volcano from space. You can't see a little censer from space. The idea is that our voices join together and there's power in that, in one voice. And that's how we become the body of Christ. And we are one body. And the saints talk about that all the time. Whenever I think about that, I think about some of the lives of the saints. Saint Basil, I think when he was being challenged and exiled, Saint Basil, when he would celebrate the liturgy, would levitate off the ground at the altar and he would appear as if he was on fire. And when they didn't like some of what he was saying, the governors sent people to come to his church to arrest him when he was celebrating. They approached the church and the singing was so loud inside the church with the doors closed that they could hear it outside. And the building was shaking. And they came in and they saw everyone chanting together so powerfully they dared not come forward and arrest him. Think about that back in the fourth century. Then I think about someone very recent like St. Jacobo Savevia, who was just canonized a few years ago. And whenever he would celebrate the services, he would see angels. He would enter the great entrance, and sometimes he would see the wing of an angel next to him. Because what was happening was otherworldly, heavenly, transformative. It was worship in spirit and in truth. And that's happening around us. We have this beautiful representation through the iconography of the choir of the saints. But the saints and the angels are with us in the liturgy. We're worshiping in spirit and in truth. All we have to do is wake up and realize that that's happening and plug into that. And then our lives become transformed. Then we're not just coming to church for fellowship and for community and for a sense of belonging and to see our friends. We're not coming to church to be re-energized so that we could get through the week because church isn't about us, it's about Him and us being a part of His body. And then we become worshipers in spirit and in truth and that changes our whole life. That runs out into the rest of the week. Just 45 minutes or an hour on Sunday morning can transform the other six days if we really are worshiping in spirit and in truth. So it's our challenge whenever the time of the Samaritan woman comes and we hear about this, this true worship, to remind ourselves what we're really doing in these four walls, that we're trying to focus on allowing that smoke, that great plume, that volcano to rise, that we unite our voices, that we're not a hundred people saying a hundred different things at the same time, some praying for this, some praying for that. We're all praying the same thing at the same time, the same prayers, the same hymns, and there's power in that prayer, and that prayer rises to God, and that's true worship, and that transforms our heart and our mind, and it allows us to get closer and closer to Christ each and every day. Amen.